So now begins the second section of this series, in which I break down each project I'm either currently working on or may work on in the future. For you to get the most out of it, I recommend watching parts 2 and 3 of this series first if you haven't yet, because they provide the context and terminology that makes this discussion easier. That's why I made them. This video takes a look at my Let's Fly Around Real Mist series, because it's taken some twists and turns that have surprised even me, and have played a pivotal role in the evolution of this channel. As of this upload, I've completed parts 1 through 4, but haven't made part 5 yet. If you haven't watched that series, I hope you take the time to at least watch part 3 before watching this one, because that video has some of my best material, and I'm about to spoil it here. Alright, let's go! Back in 2013, I found a hack somewhere online that allowed me to change the gravity settings for Real Mist, and explore the 3D environment outside the normal boundaries. I discovered a lot of funny things going on that I didn't really understand, so it seemed like a fun thing to show off in a video series. The idea was that it was going to be a simple, easy series. I could explore how the game looks from a bunch of new angles, I could show how it breaks when you push the boundaries too far, and maybe I could even use these experiments to try to figure out how the internal game logic worked. The series itself though wasn't supposed to be its own interesting story. Perhaps that's why it is one. It ended up taking a life of its own, but before I can get into that, I need to explain why I felt the series was worth making in the first place. After all, finding this fundamental purpose is something I mentioned in the previous video. At first glance, it may seem a bit pointless. Many games have these kinds of hacks that allow you to easily warp your way around through them. The experience usually starts off fun and exciting, but quickly becomes predictable in a reasonably stable 3D environment like what you see here. Once you understand the rules, everything you see starts to make sense and even look the same. Moreover, a hack like this doesn't exactly contribute to the story, gameplay, or any other objective the game intended. And after a few minutes, omnipotence starts to get boring. Once you've seen one game like this, you've seen them all. But exploring the early generation 3D universe of Real Mist really isn't a typical out of bounds experience. That game is especially entertaining to fly around in because of how it was built. On one hand, they did a lot of clever things to try to minimize the load on old computers of the day, but on the other hand, it was still poorly optimized and it generally feels like it was made out of cardboard. For whatever reason, it looks like they tried to find different ways to solve the same problem on each age, so it has a surprise around every corner. It's just the gift that keeps on giving. So I've never worried about the series becoming stale. The design of this series presents a unique kind of challenge because I have to poke around a while just to figure out what I need to show, and there's no way to know whether I actually found all the good stuff. I can't just list out the game achievements like I did in my Space Quest example in the last video. But I'm not claiming to have found everything, so I'm not too worried about this being a problem either. The real concern emerged as I was wrapping up the first episode flying around Mist Island. Right at that moment, Cyan just had to announce the Real Mist Masterpiece Edition. All I could think at the time was that it just nullified my last two months of work. But I released the video anyway, and it turns out people still like the older version of the game, so it doesn't bother me as much anymore. So I decided it was worth it to go ahead and make the whole series. In the second episode, I covered the Mechanical Age, and promised to go through the ages in the same order as my Let's Play series. But that's when I quit the channel for a long time, and didn't work on much of anything for the next several years. When I came back, I wanted this to be one promise I actually made good on, even if it was late. So once I did come back, next up was the Selenitic Age. It started off in the same vein as before. But after I made the first recording which covered the surface of the Selenitic Age, I just kept coming back to this chasm. And suddenly everything changed. The best angles for it are down by the lava, of course. But the rest of the surface is more appropriately covered at a higher altitude, and that clip was already finished. So what's the best way to include the chasm in the video at this point? If you've seen the video, then of course you already know what I did. But to examine the question properly, we have to start with the broader question. Who is the character for this series? Up to this point, instead of playing a character at all, I found it more appropriate to just show and tell you everything directly as myself. As I said earlier, this was supposed to be a simple series, so I didn't want to overcomplicate anything, and it's hard enough to describe what's going on without adding my own artificial layers. It's true that at the very beginning of the first episode, I sort of pretend to lose control and not know what's going on, but that doesn't really count. It was just a low effort, tongue in cheek way to introduce the feature more than anything, and immediately afterward I showed all the steps I took to hack it. 
At the time, I thought that was the only thing I was going to do like that in this series. But when weighing options for how to display the chasm, the ones that play it straight just don't hold a candle to those that bring back the character. I made up a bit in which the underground maze would suddenly teleport me to the chasm, and then falling into the lava resets the maze. There is nothing plausible about this narrative actually being a mechanic in the game, but I was such a straight talker up to this point in the series that it still confused some people. In the first teleporting scene, which is obviously the one that catches everybody off guard, I tried to sprinkle in some clues with carefully worded commentary if you listen closely. What you see this far down that still looks bad, right? Because... Wait a minute. Something is wrong here. What? This can't be real! This is not possible! Holy shit! Uh, I must have imagined that. Um, okay, so... See, I was trying to tell you something, but the character can't explain it outright because of his very nature. Instead, now I have to hedge the commentary between cluing you in, but also saying something the character might actually say in that situation. For this reason, I did have misgivings about trying it. The fact that it's a joke only becomes clear the second time it happens, but unfortunately the next opportunity wasn't for a full 10 minutes later into the video, so I imagine it was confusing for at least a while there. The idea was partially inspired by the famous Freeman's Mind series created by Ross Scott. His character has all sorts of jumps and freakouts and other overt reactions that are directly communicated through the player movements. I wouldn't have thought to envelop my character completely into the world, or use camera movement to this degree myself, so credit goes where it's due. My dream is to one day produce something that's one-tenth as good as his material. God damn it! Go, go, go. Oh, oh my god. Anyway, once I came up with my chasm idea, it was just too good an opportunity to pass up. But think about the Pandora's box that just opened on the design side. The most straightforward character suddenly turned into the most difficult, contradictory basket case. Being candid about hacking a game and implicit about playing a character trapped inside it is a blatant oxymoron. I mean, just look at my second fall into the lava. As I said in part two of this series, I make the most out of individual moments. One trope I like to use is for things to seemingly go really well for the character, then suddenly everything collapses. In this case, he thought he just outsmarted the selenitic maze by going around a noisy cave. But that cave has what I called the render switch for the maze. The game only loads one half of the maze or the other at a time, and it switches between the two when you pass through the midpoint, which, as I said, lies in that cave. So if you go around it, the maze seems to disappear, as well as the sound effects. That is a real thing in the game. But then I artificially made things even worse for the character by putting another portal to the chasm at the end of the track. I think it's my favorite part of the whole chasm gag, but that doesn't change the fact I open a big can of worms here. Simply put, consistency hasn't just been ignored, it's been thoroughly trashed. The character normally enjoys the omnipotence of hacking the game like I am, but now he's subject to the game doing impossible things. And now he's touching lava. And then he just hit his chair. And now he starts talking about editing the video and putting less work into it. Of course, including this teleport back to the start was more work for me. Remember, the series was meant to be nothing but a straightforward demonstration of the inner mechanics of the game. But the character not only forces me to no longer be straightforward, but he also has a story arc that violates those same mechanics. So now the series is a big contradictory mess, and thus exactly the opposite of what it was supposed to be. At the start of part 4, I try to even imply that my character needs to head into this pillar and pass through the chasm in order to get to the stone ship age. Not only is this clearly ridiculous, but it also goes against everything in part one, when I explicitly laid out the details of how to hack the game and spawn directly into an age. This is what happens when you change the design halfway through production. It's easy to dismiss this as overthinking the problem, and the audience can easily learn not to take me seriously. But it's not that simple. 
What's worse than the character Great himself choice. being ambiguous is the fact this stunt throws away my credibility when describing the 3D worlds of realness, which was supposed to be the whole point of the series. It isn't about whether people take me seriously or not, it's about whether they can tell which moments should be taken seriously and which ones shouldn't. I think this really became a factor when I tried to explain the maze's render switch, for example. Don't get me wrong, I had a lot of fun making this gag. In fact, it's some of the most fun I've ever had making a video. I didn't realize it at the time, but you can even see my character roughly going through the five stages of grief during his misfortunes with the chasm. I guess it was such a natural thing that there was no need to force it. But I may have screwed the pooch with it too. The writing has become more complicated ever since, even if it hasn't screwed up the explanations. I'm glad people enjoyed the jokes, but that also means it's going to raise the bar going forward. I want to give the series a fitting end, but please understand, the chasm really was a one-time opportunity like nothing the other ages offer. Oh, and let's not forget that production is a major headache for this series too. The game is made of cardboard after all. I don't have any fancy engine hacks like some people. I only have the very limited control I showed in part one of the series. And in case you couldn't tell, it's really cumbersome. Let me illustrate this by showing you how hard it was just to get into position for the chasm falls. Looks like it shouldn't be too hard, right? Just float over the chasm and turn the gravity on. What's so bad about that? Technically I could, but it wouldn't be very effective. See, you can't look all the way down in this game. This is really important here because if the audience can't see the lava or they don't know to look there, then they won't know what's going on and you lose the whole effect. Fortunately, the gravity hack also has X and Y components that allow me to make custom gravity vectors at an angle. You may have noticed none of the clips in the video fell straight down into the pit. Except the last one, but that doesn't count. One method to set these up is to start at any point high above and just tweak the gravity values until they hit the middle of the pit. But that hurts you long term as you'll continually need to make adjustments. Instead, I studied the pit first to find the best speed and angle for each scene and worked from there but that meant I had to trace the vector backwards to find the correct starting point. That takes a few steps, so that's what I'll show here, using the second fall for this example. You have to quit the game every time you want to change the gravity setting, so first we need a saved game that puts us right where we want to land in the lava pit. Now we just load the autosave, right? Nope. As I've shown many times in the series, saving the game bumps us upward. This, by the way, is a persistent problem for setting up all the clips throughout the entire series, and I'm getting sick of wrestling with it. Anyway, this one will cause me to miss the pit, so let's do what I always do and sink down lower than the target and save bump up to the target. It sometimes takes a few attempts since I can't see what I'm doing, but now we're here so we load this game with the reverse of the chasm fall settings. If you do the math, you'll see this line is on the same slope. It's just slower and points in the opposite direction. I'm going to stop a little early because the actual scene had to start so high, everything on the ground disappeared. So that was even more challenging. Of course, saving puts us too high again. Even worse, the timing of this save isn't set up for the scene either. So we'll need to make another save that addresses that. So first, let's drop below the target not one, but two save bumps. Now we save and wait here for the correct timing and save again. If we do it right, the final save will have the correct timing and also put us on the trajectory line. For this particular fall, I not only had to start the scene at just the right moment during sunrise to transition properly from the maze background, but it also needed to be time to hit this little flame as it emerged from the pit. I also had to meld two takes together to get the right dead player animation. There usually aren't a lot of opportunities to switch recordings mid-scene for fly mode videos because my location is too wide out in the open. I can either try to pull it off under very specific conditions, which is really difficult, or not try to pull it off and instead attempt to do the whole scene perfectly in one go, which is also really difficult. Most of the time switching recordings is too hard to be worth the effort, but I was able to pull it off right here. I had just recorded over five straight minutes of good game capture, so obviously the point was to bank what I had and give myself multiple chances to be in the right place at the right time for the lightning. Again, save bumps make this harder than it should be.
What? Did you expect something else? The game still thinks that happened on the horizon. I was lucky to get the stone ship video out when I did. That's because there was a string of crises that almost blew up the whole video. I set a hard deadline to publish it before the Let's Play remake because the unused commentary has a small reference to it, and the remake had its own deadline for other reasons. But when I was about 80% done with barely any time left, all of a sudden these upward stutters showed up for no apparent reason. Back in the day this would always pose a threat to spontaneously ruin any given recording, but it hadn't been a problem ever since I got the capture card. But suddenly now it was so bad it was impossible to make a passable video, and I only had two or three clips left to make. It's not like the internet's going to have any resources giving advice on how to record real mist with the gravity off. So after trying everything I could think of, I did what anyone would do in that situation. I panicked. I hate admitting this, but I actually reinstalled Windows, and without even backing it up first. Fortunately, I keep my OS pretty lean, so it wasn't the worst thing to reinstall everything, but it was still a hassle that cramped my time even more. Especially since it didn't even fix the problem. I was able to figure it out just in time though. Apparently I can't do this anymore where the recorder shows a preview on one of the monitors. I don't know what suddenly made that a problem, but turning that off fixed it. But now I had a new problem. My editor then started making these weird tearing artifacts when trying to read some of the capture files. There was no way I was going to accept this, but I also hate re-recording difficult capture files, so my solution was to edit all 135 correct frames back in manually one by one. I record in a different format now, so the tearing shouldn't be a problem anymore, but who the f knows at this point. All of this was right at the 11th hour, so I didn't get much sleep that week. Somehow I barely managed to get it out on time. I guess the reason I'm venting about all this is, it may not always look like I'm doing much on this channel, but I want you to know I'm constantly scrambling to produce the best output I possibly can. Okay, so now that we're at the end of the video, it's time to address the main question. Should I pursue the rest of the fly mode project? This is a theme I'm going to repeat for every project featured in this series. So while the question seems trivial for fly mode because I'm already so far along with it, most of the time the answer won't be so clear. The best I can do is list out the reasons in favor of pursuing it and the reasons against it. So in the spirit of consistency, let's do that exercise here. The first reason I should finish the fly mode series is that I said I would. I can't have all my lingering projects stall out forever. However, it is really hard to make, so it drags the channel down when I could be working on something else. I did not realize this would happen when I started it. Another positive is that it features a Myst game, so these are iconic locations I'm exploring. Also, most of my viewers are Myst fans, so I can jump right into it without having to explain any of the game. However, it is an outdated version of Myst. It's fun, sure, but it seems a bit irrelevant to pick apart the 3D of that era. It may look like I'm just punching down at this point. That being said, a major strength of the project is its uniqueness. Not just the flying aspect, but also the engine I'm flying in. I talked about this earlier. Additionally, I like this new character I've injected into it. Although he comes with some problems and I don't use him all the time, he adds a new dimension to the series that I think ultimately makes it more fun. However, according to the analytics, this series doesn't conjure up the interest that I first thought it did. This is likely due to the enormous gaps in upload dates, but even now there's some evidence that people who find the first video don't continue watching. The best videos are the recent ones, so it's their loss, I guess. This is why it's so important for the first episode to be as good as everything else, which is something I've struggled with in the past, and need to rectify with a better design process going forward. Of course, the reason none of this matters, and I'm going to finish the fly mode project no matter what, is that I'm already 80% done with it. I can't stop now. So there will be one more fly mode video. I'll cover the last two ages together, even if it results in the longest video in the series. Forget the idea of the series being a minor project, it's already about three hours long. I'm also going to have to figure out an appropriate ending. Don't be surprised if it takes me three months to make this one. Before I begin work on it though, first I'll make one more installment to this series. Instead of covering a project I've mostly completed, the next video will focus on an idea for a new project I haven't done anything with. But it's by far the most requested project I get on this channel, so you might not want to miss this one. See you 
in part five.